almost about that time. Right about now. Right about now. Funk, funk, funk. Funk, so brother. Brother, brother, brother. Richard Osmond, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. Thank you so much, Jonathan. My absolute pleasure. It is so great to have you and um, big fan of your writing and your stories. Congratulations on all the success you're having with Murder Club Mystery. Incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's, a, it's a surprise amount of success. I'll say that. Yeah, I, I want to um yeah, I really want to get into that. I, you know, you are you're pretty you're well known in um, in England, not as well known here, although that's changing very quickly because you're a big sort of TV star in in England, right? I mean, you you're on yeah. television regularly. That's it. Yeah, I'm on every day. I do I, I, I do quizzes, and so yeah, over, over here I sort of think I, I I can sort of work out why people buy the books over here or, or why they've heard of them in the first place. Right, I I get that. But but yeah, when 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 you're selling in America and China and Brazil and Australia, you just think, wow, this is. I didn't. I did, first, you don't know me. And secondly, these books are so English. Yeah, you know, they really are. Like, but I think P Americans love English stuff. I mean, a lot of them do. Maybe it's our. I think, yeah, <laughs> and also if I, you know, truthfully, if I if I read a Brazilian book, I just think, listen, make it as Brazilian as you can. Right, really tell me about Brazil. Tell me where you go shopping. You know, just make it super Brazilian. So I think if you, if you have any kind of interest in the, in other countries, I guess I guess that some of the <laughs> the kind of British minutiae. Authentic, uh, yes. People love authenticity. Books. It's a, it's an overused word, but it, it is authentic. And you're getting you know you're not getting a brushed over version of, of England here. This is this is the real. Yeah, I think not. So let so because people don't know you as well, I'd love to talk a little bit about your origin story because it's really interesting, kind of where you came from. You, I was doing a little reading about you, and you grew up you a lower middle class background, right, in a place called West Sussex. Yeah, that's right. And tell us a little bit about your family. Your your dad was a was a a cop. My grandfather was a cop. Your grandfather, uh, but, but he he was sort of he, he was my main role model. My dad left left from me very young, so you know my grandparents are very present in my life and 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 my mum brought us up but yeah my grandfather was a cop and we're from a big working class family all on the south coast of, of, of england if, if anyone knows it and like anywhere like anywhere by the sea like it's dodgy right if ever if ever you go anywhere by the seaside it's lovely and it's nice and you know you get to see the ocean but my god you know that stuff is going on and so, you know, I, I, I grew up with my grandfather's kind of tales of, of, of being a cop in Brighton. And, you know, he'd take you down streets and tell you what happens behind certain doors. Uh, and, you know, it's always fascinated me, that thing. of Because we all live amongst it, right? We all live amongst this sort of shadow economy. And there's yeah. people driving around the streets and we don't know how they made their money. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an intriguing world. And, you know, that, 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 that's the world that, that, that I grew up in. And as you say, in a... In a in West Sussex, which is which is roughly where where, where the books are set, um, and uh, it, it, it's a place that sort of remains very dear to me. But especially the kind of underbelly of it, especially <laughs> the criminal yeah, the side CD of it. Part. Because, and that, you think that's largely due to your to your grandfather? I think so. Listen, it must be in the genes anyway, right? I, I you know, we respond. Who knows why? A lot of us respond to crime and crime. You know, we love it. We 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 love that idea. So I can. I have an excuse, right? That's my grandfather was a cop, you know. So, but that is just an excuse. So actually, I'm just I'm I'm grimly fascinated in all of it. That's why I've always read crime fiction, and that's why I wrote crime fiction because I always I always try and do the thing that I would like to read, and then you get exactly what you're talking about that authenticity. If you're writing if you're writing the thing that you would enjoy, I think people spot that straight away. Right. Um, you mentioned I I read a, a really beautiful essay you wrote. There's a a book called Letter to My Younger Self, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and you wrote about being nine years old um, in, in, in growing up and when your father, um, can you tell us a little bit about what happened when you were nine in your family? Yeah, so my, you know, my, my, my dad left when I was nine and it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't come from a family where there's lots of rows or anything like that. So, so to me, it was like a shock, like a brutal shock. Like, you know, I had no idea. Uh, and this would this would have been like 1979 as well, so 1970s, and people didn't really know how to divorce and separate, and so we never right. really saw him again. 
right? He kind of disappeared, mm. and there was no, there was no what we would call aftercare. Now, yeah. no, no one was thinking. I wonder if it's important for those two boys to have their, <laughs> to, to have their father around. You know, I wonder, if, I wonder if that might psychologically be a useful thing for them to have. Uh, and you know what? It wasn't there, and it's no one's fault either. You know what? It's it was the time, right? He probably could have been a bit tougher about it, but you know, he wasn't. He was, you know. So off he went. Um, and so yeah, so I, I I grew up without him. I, grew, I was very lucky to grow up with a, a mother who's brilliant and you know loving and all, all that kind of stuff. But certainly, I grew up without that role model. But what I did grow up with, of course, is is is, is an ability there to to weave a narrative. Because my narrative there is it's okay, it's okay that my dad left. It's kind of fine. I don't need this guy. You know, I don't have to worry about my mom crying at night. Everything's okay. And like a lot of writers, you just, you just get very, very skilled at just shifting perspective a tiny bit, just to say, oh, well, let's just let's just look away from this pain and this difficulty and just go, everything's okay over here. Let's 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 tell this lovely story. And um, you know, trauma. Listen, my trauma is as nothing compared to an awful lot of trauma. Uh, but trauma is never the problem, is it? It's inability to deal with trauma is all the thing. Is mm. you know that's the thing. If you have trauma, you leave it untreated. Then my yeah. God, you, you 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 get a long way down the path before you know you, you before you get any help. And if you're a long way down the path, you're a very very long way from where you need to be. And so I think that's sort of the story of my childhood. Part of the story of my childhood, by the way, a brilliant mother who's very loving. So I, I, I'm enormously lucky there. But the other part is giving a child who has an imagination, letting him tell a story and weave a narrative that wasn't true and that nobody was particularly interested in unraveling or challenging, you know? And so that, 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 that I think had consequences later in life. Have you, have you later in life tried to tell the, the correct narrative there to yourself? Has that been healing for you? Yeah, for sure. You know, I have, and again, I'm not, I'm not from the sort of background where, where, where therapy would naturally be a thing, but in my thirties, I've turned a very, Good friend of my boss of mine, I know it been in nice. I just said, help me out here because I'm not I'm not the person that I need to be. I, you know, you can you, you can spot it, right? You get so far away from who you're supposed to be that eventually you're like, well, you're either the sort of person who says I'm going to drag the world over to me, you'd be like a Trump type figure who just think you're so damaged and you can't find your way back to where you need to be, so you bend the world to you. Mm. or you kind of go i'm damaged i need to get back to where i was and so in my early 30s i started that journey um and a i'm very glad i did and b i think that it's it's hard it's hard to spend any period of time with a really good therapist without really finding out a few things about a yourself would be about the world as well and about other people and other people's pain and you know as a as a writer I love to write funny stuff and I love to make people laugh more than anything in the world. But I also like to write about pain and I like to write about why people behave in certain ways to avoid it. And I hope that the, those things, that combination of sort of understanding people's pain and also really, really wanting to make, to make people laugh and also being fascinated with crime, those three things hopefully come together and, and, and explain some of, the, some of the sales figures uh, for, for these books maybe. <laughs> There's, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And, you know, what you've done is, is really remarkable. Um, you mentioned it, and I don't want to just talk about all the hard things in your life here, but you, mm -hmm. you know, you have mentioned publicly about that you had a food addiction and I'm yeah. curious how that play, how that, or, or how that has played out in your life and what that is exactly and, and how you yeah. manage that. Yeah. And listen, we can talk about the nice things in a bit. Let's get, all okay. We're gonna, yeah. Let's get the, let's, let's get, get all the bad stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> People can listen to this on one and a half speed. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that if, 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 if you are lying to yourself, if you, if you are creating something that isn't your true self, um, you, you, you do essentially need something to bridge that gap, right? You need something, you know, as the world moves further and further away from you, you need something to numb yourself a little bit. And, you know, that, that's alcohol for lots of people drugs for lots of people it can be all sorts of things it can be attachment you know for me it was food which maybe it's because you know it all started when I was nine now food food addiction you, I'm very comfortable that people can believe it doesn't exist it's absolutely you, you must take your own view mm -hmm. on these things and you know it's it, it, it's it's not a um you know it's not uh, it's often derided which mm -hmm. is 
absolutely fine. So I have two choices, right? My reality is, I know, I know it's an addiction. I know it's a psychological addiction. There's physical addictions as well. And of course, there are the, the industry has spent billions making food, you know, more, more and more sort of immediately addictive. Um, but psychologically, there's huge addiction issues mm. around food, right? So I know it. And I know it's controlled my life for 30 odd years. So I do one of two things. Either I don't talk about it, which I did for years and years and years. Or I just say, do you know what? Please ridicule me if you wish. Honestly, your loss. However, since I started speaking about it over here, the amount of people in emails and just on the street who come up to me and say, my husband came in the room the other day, he was crying. He just heard you on the thing on the show in the UK. And he said, that's me. He said, that is me. He said, I've never heard it spoken about. He said, and I've been ashamed of that every day of my life. Mm. You know, I've been, and they're in tears. And it's hundreds of people, right? We only have to look around us, right, in the UK. And we know there's a, there's, there's a food addiction epidemic, right? Because nothing else explains what's going on. We know how to eat. We know what's healthy by now. We're not kind of going, oh, sorry, I didn't know. You. Oh, if you ate salads, that, then we lose weight. Oh, I didn't know that. We all know, right? We all got it. We've got the message. But we are, there's an awful lot of people who are addicted. Right? I'm one of them. Uh, and I always will be, right? And I've had lots and lots of therapy, so I'm, I'm cool with it. Right? Right. And I can control it a lot of the time. Uh, and sometimes I can't control it. And when I can't, you know what? I just accept it. I'm like, listen, that's cool. Don't worry too much about it. The key thing to get rid of, the key thing with any addiction is to rob it of shame, right? Mm. I was deeply ashamed of it. And secret drinkers are deeply ashamed. And secret drug addicts and gamblers are ashamed, right? And if you can shine a light on it and talk about it, then the one thing that you lose first is the shame, right? And once you've lost the shame, actually, you can start dealing with it because the shame wants you to lock yourself away and the shame wants you to keep numbing yourself and the shame wants you to keep you know that's the thing that keeps you in these these behavioral patterns and once you kind of i'm embarrassed about it for sure right i find it embarrassing am mm. i ashamed of it no and the fact that i'm not ashamed of it means that i can talk about it when it's happening to me when i'm in the middle of an episode i'm like okay this this is, this, this is what it is but i do know that by speaking about it by other people hearing about it that, that, that it's helpful you know and so that's why i'm, I'm yeah. comfortable talking about it may i ask how 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 it manifests itself because i'm trying to understand because i feel like everybody probably feels like they have some yeah. food addiction right because everybody loves to eat oh i mean uh, listen i love to eat and when i'm stressed yeah. i will sometimes go into drive to the donut shop and eat food that i should yeah. so i wonder tell me a little bit about how it manifests itself well it manifests itself in 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 its secrecy in its in its uh, intensity um, in its effect on you, its long-term effect on you, in, 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 in your feelings of powerlessness, in hiding it from people and it, that affecting your life. Um, so it, it manifests itself in, in, in that way that lots of addictive behaviours do, which is you try and keep it secret and it affects people around you and it's out of your control. And I don't mean it's out of your control for a day. I remember someone saying once I was talking they say oh do you find Christmas day difficult because of all the you know there's so much food around isn't there and there's you know there's so much chocolate and snacks and and I said honestly if I'm in an episode and that can go on for a year every day is Christmas day every single day is Christmas day I, I can eat all of that all day every day right I can you know at Christmas you, you know you go out and buy candy and chocolates in the shops Here, here's a newsflash that candy and those chocolates are available all year round all year round yeah. you can go and buy them and some and people are buying them right mm -hmm. you know and people are buying them and eating them and people get those sharing packs of you know you see the chocolate in a sharing pack and you think no one is sharing that right those big things of chocolate in the sharing pack no one's sharing them they're taking them home they're eating them by themselves because you know that's the way it is and if you do that once a month that's absolutely fine if you're doing it every day and you feel you can't get out of that routine and that rut and it's eating away at you then that's uh, that that would be my experience of an addiction all right, let's shift gears here. So yeah. at, you you grew up uh, in this situation that you've explained and you um you start off right wanting to be a writer. Like early in your career, you you kind of 
partook a little bit in some writing, but it, it, it sh- tell me a little bit about that and then kind of where you made the shift and, and then what happened in your career. Yeah, so I, I, did, I did some journalism. Uh, and when, when, when I started in TV, I did comedy writing and joke writing and, 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 and sitcom writing, stuff like that. And I always loved writing. But I was a TV kid growing up as well, really, is the truth. You know, that's the, that, that, that was the thing I loved. And so I was in the world of telly anyway with, with, with the joke writing. I started coming up with TV formats. And this would be mid-90s, when, about 2000. This is when formats start, became like the biggest business in the world. Mm-hmm. And so, Explain to our uh, audience what formats means. A format would be, you know, a format would be what you would call non-scripted television. So it's mm-hmm. so it's, it's anything anything from a quiz show to <laughs> like uh, you know to a whose line is it anyway to a survivor. Anything where you say, Look, here's a group of people, let's do something interesting with them. Yeah, uh, and in the end, some somebody wins. Right. That's yeah. kind of we we, some, we call it reality, but it also kind of spans into. Um, you know, um, yeah. game show, what we call game shows and quiz shows. Exactly yeah. like that. And yeah, any, any, anything from deal or no deal to, you know, yeah, yeah survivor, exactly. Um, and so that was something that, that I loved doing. And I, I ran a company called Endermol over here for, for, for years from about 2000. And because that business was so exciting and lucrative and, you know, fulfilled lots of creative uh, itches, I sort of, I sort of did that for, you know, a good twenty years. That's all I did. I did four. Ran Endemol, yeah, yeah, and and it makes a lot of cool. help, makes a lot of quiz. Endemol, which I'm familiar with because I, this is something we share in common. I actually worked at the Game Show Network for a number of years back here. Uh, in the cool. <laughs> so I I know Endemol very well. Um, and so so you worked there, but you were like running this huge production company that makes. How did you then transition into becoming like a host? Well, that 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 was entirely accidental really so we, we would always if we're if we're pitching you know if we were pitching to the game show network right we're pitching a new quiz you you can't pitch it or you can't explain to someone how a quiz works i can't say to you right here's the thing right you start with four contestants then right you have to show people right so you play it so you get a channel down to a room you'll get some contestants and you'll play the format out you say this is how a show would look from start to finish and whenever we would do that i would always make sure producers were, were, were presenting it because producers know what can go wrong with the format and they know what's good about it they know what to they know how to set it and so we we're doing a show called pointless uh which we've come up with which is a good title already for a, for a tv show yeah uh, and it's got two hosts got hosts and a, and, a, and a co-host and i took the co-host role which is sort of giving extra facts and sort of a bit of banter and this or the other uh so it was for the bbc they bought the show they loved the show they bought it in the room they said yeah 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 this is this this, this will do us they found a good host and they, they couldn't find this co-host figure, right? Because I'd kind of done it and I was making jokes and I was mucking about. And yeah. I thought, well, we need someone who can do that. And then, because they knew me quite well, so I'm in pictures of them for 10, 15 years. And, you know, they, they knew I was a comedy writer. They said, well, look, would you, why don't you do it? Yeah. And I was like, and I was 40 at this stage. Right? Yeah. I had zero interest. I'd never been on stage. I just, it's not for me. But I kind of said, yeah, you know what? I love television. Why not? I'll do it. It's, it'll be a story to tell the grandkids about, you know, that I did this one series of a show that disappeared. Right? So I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do this show, Pointless. Uh, and that's 12 years ago. And that show's still on air now. And it's on every day. And it's, it's such a huge hit. Right? It just Wild. became this massive phenomenon. Right? And I was at the heart of it completely accidentally. So, yeah, I, 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 I became fairly quickly a, a sort of familiar face on screen in Britain, which for me it is, you know, it, I promise you, it's not what I was after. I was, that's yeah. not what I was seeking out. But you know, I quite, I quite like it. And you know, now I do other shows and other comedy shows and this and the other. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm a. So now I don't really do any more producing. I sort of gave up producing because being a presenter is easier than being a producer. Uh, so I sort of, and I've been a producer for, you know, twenty yeah. years. And so I was looking for a new challenge. Uh, and then you know, four years ago, I thought do you know what you've got to go back to the thing that you love because i had a bit more time because presenting doesn't take much time yeah and i thought you've got to go back to the thing you love and do some writing i thought well i'll just give it a go you know and that that sort of le- leads us to to where we are today that that's amazing though because most people you know at 40 45 whatever the, you know when they're successful like why would you do the writing which is we all know how hard writing is right oh my god yeah <laughs> and uh you know and to say i'm gonna just I'm going to write a few novels. And not only that, I'm going to write mystery novels, which are really tricky to write. Um, what, what motivated you to do that? 
Uh, I think that, you know, I loved the creative side of, 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 of making formats. Being a TV presenter is kind of, it's fine, it's fun. Right. I don't know if it particularly was challenging me. Yeah. I don't know if, I, if you were seeing the best of me. Um, and I have always written, you know, and I'd always thought at some point, I've always scribbled down the first chapter of a novel, like for years, always a crime novel, because it, it's, it, it's what I read. Um, and I got to the stage where I thought, do you know what, you've got a couple of months where you've got some time on your hands now. And the key thing with a book is you, you need time on your hands. There's no, there's no shortcut to writing a novel. I mean, there just isn't. It's like everything else I've ever done, presenting formats, you can do in a day and you can sell tomorrow. You know, it's, whereas a novel, you have got to put the hours in. You really, really do. So you've got to be ready. Um, and I had the idea for the Thursday Murder Club. And that came at roughly the same time as I was thinking, maybe you've got a bit of time now. So I thought, come on then, just don't tell anyone you're doing it. Just start writing this story, you know, just start writing the story about these four people solving crimes because it's in your heart. You know, you've got it. You've got a great title already. I had the Thursday murder cup as a title. And it, a TV it, it sort of start with it. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm the same way because I'm a magazine guy. It always starts with the headline or the title. And, and, yeah. uh, and, and so talk to us a little bit about how you came up with this idea because it was inspired by visiting your mom, right, in, in, a, in, a, in a retirement village. Yeah, she lives in, 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 in this retirement village um, in, in, in the south of England. And, you know, two things, creativity to me is always when two of the little bubbles around your head bump into each other and form mm -hmm. a big new bubble, right? And the two bubbles in my head here were, I would go down there all the time and you'd meet these amazing people. Everyone there's in their 70s. Uh, and they've all done these interesting things with their lives, you know, and they've all got these incredible stories. And yet they've sort of got to the stage of their life where they felt no longer needed and they've been slightly overlooked. Uh, and I would always think, God, there's so much talent in here and so much wisdom in here. And again, listen, this wasn't a great thought. It's just a tiny little bubble that was out somehow. I just, I'd always, I'd noticed it, right? I'd noticed it. And then just one time I was there and I was idly just looking around at how beautiful the place was and the sun was shining and the birds were singing and there's a lake down the bottom. And I just thought, oh my God, this would be such an amazing place for a murder, right? I just <laughs> yeah. thought it just, you know, in that kind of Agatha Christie way, I just, I was just thinking, so that's another bubble I got. And then suddenly those two bubbles bumped into each other. And I thought, well, hold on, what if there's a murder here? And then we use the skills of the people who live here to solve that murder, you know? Yeah. And again, with a TV ideas head, and I just thought, man, that's got legs. I mean, I really like it because I've got the heroes here, right? Yeah. I love crime fiction anyway, so I, I, I want to write murders, you know, and that I love. And suddenly, I've got this gang of people who I know, I just know people are going to adore, and they've got these different skill sets. I can put together a gang, you know, I can put together, you know, the A-team, like the A-team meets Miss Marple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Uh, and I just, you know, when that bubble appeared, those two ideas hitting together, and I had that time, I thought, mate, this is the one. You know, this is this is the one you've got to write. The characters all, they literally... Yeah, I was going to ask, like, how do the... Because the characters are so unique, and so, I mean, it's what really makes the book so special. So you've got, you know, a retired M MI5 agent, a former nurse, a psychiatrist. Yeah. I mean, did you... They're very ar archetypal, right? Did you um, kind of sit down and say, okay, who are, who are my four people, or did they just sort of come to you naturally? You know, they really came to me naturally. I think they're, they're four bits of my own brain anyway. I'd had one of those many abortive chapters I'd written years ago was about a former spy. So I'd always had that character in my mind. Someone, uh, a female former spy, who, who they tended to be uh, overlooked, but there's these amazing figures from British Secret Service history. Um, my mum in that community, she, my mum was, 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 was a teacher, like infant kids. Uh, and I always loved her role in that community, which was, all these kind of big beasts would sort of, would, you know, if ever there was a problem, they'd all kind of lock horns and they'd be arguing. And then my mum would step in and say, why don't we do this? You know, because <laughs> she was used to dealing with kids. Yeah. And so this idea of Joyce, who is a former nurse, but the, but the person who all these kind of people who'd had these very alpha careers around her, but she was the one who actually got stuff done. So that felt like a, a character. Uh, Ron, who's, who, who's a labour activist, I wanted someone sort of representing my grandfather. He, my grandfather was a cop. But he's, he was a proper, like almost a communist, you know, he's a very, very left wing. Um, you know, he wouldn't go and 
if, if ever there was a labor dispute my grandfather wouldn't go and police it he would say no that's not my business i'm not i'm not going up there to sort of police a picket line uh so he he became ron and and and, and ibrahim is a psychiatrist he just I just like the idea of having us. It just is obvious to me you would have a psychiatrist in there because I want to hear his internal dialogue, you know. Yeah. And the best thing about all psychiatrists is they all need therapists. All <laughs> of them. They became therapists because they need therapy. And so that's a fun character for me. Two of them are men, two of them are women. Two of them are working class, two of them are middle class, as, as, as we would call it over here. And so it suddenly felt to me like I've got a gang here that I can throw anything at and one of them will be able to fix it. And it will always be somewhat, a different one, but they all have enough skills. And also their relationships to each other will all be different. You know, they're four parts of, what, of, of, of one brain, but, the, but the, and I can write chapters from each of their perspectives. Uh, and so, you know, it's just, that's the kind of thing I like to read. Short chapters, different perspectives, jumping around, people you love. Uh, and, you know, it just, it, it felt like it, it was all there from where go. Now you have you mentioned that you're a real student of mystery novels and you, that's what you read in crime novels, um, but they're tricky to write because there's a lot of red herrings. There's a lot of uh, you mm. know. I, ha, did you map it? Do you map out your books before you before you write them, or do you kind of go? No, no, I don't at all. Yeah, I, I just go with it, and I, I find them not tricky to write. I've, I, I've always found, I've always found creatively. If you give me rules, I find it easier. Mm -hmm. You know, if I know that. I am hidebound by certain things. If I know there's certain things I've got to include, if I know that I've got to end up at this certain place at a certain time, great. Then I, I will literally dance around within those rules. You know, that that's yeah. the thing that I love. If you said to me, write me a novel about the world, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah but, you need But with parameter. a murder mystery, I'll, I'll give you chaos. At the end, I will solve that chaos for you. Uh, and meantime, what you want me to lay a series of traps, you want me to set some red herrings, you want me to, uh, great. That's, I love that. That's like a joy. But these books succeed or fail on character. Nothing else. And that's the thing. We, there's a million crime books out there. right? They succeed or fail on do we love these characters? You know, am I enjoying spending time with these people? And, you know, that's the thing about the Thursday Murder Club. I think if, 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 if it has been elevated at all, it's, it's, it's elevated by those characters who we sort of feel such an attachment to. Uh, and, and 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 who we care about so much and i don't think you're able to do that sort of thing without the rules of crime fiction to me the rules are what buys you the stuff in between that's what buys you these these these, these lovely people what are some it's of saying, the rules i mean you probably there's not like a book of i mean there probably are there probably are books of rules but yeah, there probably, some yeah, of the rules, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of them but but you yeah, know, yeah, you've exactly. internalized i think you've probably internal like you didn't go and buy a crime yeah. book book exactly what are some of the rules uh, that you know i mean well, obviously it starts the with the body are, the big rule is you can't cheat the reader right the big rule is this at the end i'm going to tell you what happened right at the end i'm going to reveal what happens right however i have already told you right i cannot send this book off to the publishers without having already told you how it's done before we reveal it right mm -hmm. when i reveal it you have to be able to go back over it and go oh yeah right yeah he told me yeah he told me you know and that i love as a rule another rule is as much as possible everyone must be a suspect right that's the that's the thing you people mustn't be ruled out yeah uh, and when um, when you've got that it's, it's funny i was, I was hearing a discussion the other day about there was a writer saying oh, i changed the murderer of my book right at the last minute i changed who did it and someone was saying Oh my, but you had to, you must have had to untangle everything. But here's the thing given the rule is everyone must be a suspect, the truth is you don't have to untangle anything. If you decide right at the last minute that it's a different murderer, if you've done it properly, which crime writers do, then that person would have been set up as a suspect anyway. And you might have to turn off a couple of little gas taps here and turn on a couple more here, but you don't have to untangle anything because. You've set up that that person is. You've set up that everyone is a suspect, and so you can change your mind at the last minute. And I read books so many times where you think, oh, "I bet you changed your mind at the last minute." It's great, and it's a great twist. But I bet that wasn't in your brain when you started this. I bet that was the thing, just sort of a month before you handed it in. You just went, "Do you know what? What if I just did one more roll of the dice? What if I just did one more?" And you know, you just did it, and then you sort of go back and just finesse a little bit. But everyone's a suspect, and so in the end anyone can have done it.
I love that. Well, one rule that you did break, and this is not a break of crime, uh, rule in crime, but it's just sort of a, a rule that I feel like popular culture follows is that there's a sort of weird feeling, oh, people aren't interested in, you know, people in their 70s, like as protagonists, mm -hmm. you know, like that's not, you don't see a lot of movies. I mean, every so often you'll see one like Clint Eastwood will appear in one or whatever. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the, you, they'll roll them out. But it's like, generally speaking, you know, all the actors are younger. Why do you think this has appealed uh, to so many people of all ages? It's not like people are picking this up that are only in their, you know, 70s and 80s. This is like, everybody likes these books. So what do you think it is about these characters, about telling the stories from these perspectives that people appeal mm -hmm. to so much? Well, I, I think it's exactly that. I think that it's quite unusual in our culture. I think we're sort of fed 25-year-old Instagrammers. Yeah. And, you know, if that's all well and good, I get it. I, I, I get how that works. But I think that, you know, I was lucky. I'm, if you've got heroes in your 70s, firstly, there's something sort of joyous about that, right? It's a, there's an underdog story there, right? And there's, and there's hope that perhaps that's who I become. Um, I think if you just had that, if you just had oh my God, look at these people in the 70s, haven't they done well, right? Then that doesn't work because that's, like that, that's, that's like a fantasy. That's like the X-Men, but you know, everyone's in their 70s, right? It's, but I think because I write about them as heroes and I've used their wisdom and I use their invisibility to solve these things, uh, but I, I also have a, a duty I take very seriously that I, I have to show the other side. I have to show the frailty of being in your 70s. I have to show the grief. I have to show you being around death. I have to show the things that you've lost. I have to show dementia. I have to show regret. I have to show that stuff. And I think as soon as you do that, it's, you are, that buys you the right to make them heroes, right? Mm -hmm. That buys you the right to say, these people are solving all these crimes, right? Because I'm, because they're not superheroes, right? They're yeah. just, smart people it's wise smart people and the stuff around them and the grief around them and the, their bodies falling apart and and, and 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 all of this means that no no one when no one's being patronized in this book right no one's saying didn't you do well you know yeah. it's just saying wouldn't it be lovely in our 70s to have new friendships and new adventures and momentum and all those things that we sort of deny to people when when when, when they get to a certain age, uh, and I think that that's a very appealing message to anyone of any age. Yeah, and it, it, as one of my relatives said to me, he's a huge fan of your books. You know, I want to be these people when I grow up. Like I, yeah. you know, it's almost like an aspirational in that way. You know, you you have well, this. We fear we, we 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 fear old age, and one thing we fear is sort of is sort of loneliness. And the thing about living in this community, and the thing about literally putting these people in a gang. It's about the fact that we can still be around people and we can still gossip and there's still politics and there's still romance. You know, that, you know, listen, loads of stuff is terrible, right? But you can still start drinking at 11.30 if you want to. And, you know, you can still, you know, have a row with your neighbor and then you can still make up and have a cup of tea, right? All of those things are still open to us. And yeah, I would love to live in the community these people live in. It's, I, think it's, um, I, I think it's probably the way to go in the future. Um, so... Okay, so this book, these books have been hugely successful. Um, now Steven Spielberg has optioned, right? Mm. Right. Tell yeah. me what that was like when you found out that news. Well, that that's interesting because that, that sort of takes us back to the to, to, to the origin story of, of 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 being in the UK and being recognizable than me writing a book and thinking, am I a fraud? Right? Thinking, yeah. have I I've written this book, but do they want to publish it because I'm the guy from TV? Mm. Right. And within a week, even before we sold to the UK, the Germans bought the book, right? So I thought, okay, that's interesting because they don't know who I am. They just read yeah. the book and they said, yeah, we want this. We, we'll sign them up for two books. We, we love it. I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then Spielberg was on the phone saying, I love this story. I want to buy this story. And he obviously had no idea who I was and still yeah. probably doesn't. Uh, so, you know, so that as well. So I'm suddenly in a position where I think, because I didn't know if the book was any good. No one who's ever written a book knows if it's any good. Yeah. Um, so it's you know, it the success surprise. I mean, I guess the success surprises anybody, but it, you know, you knew that your sort of core fans were probably going to buy it, but the fact, yeah. That well, I thought, yeah. Like with anything, I thought, well, I, I thought we, we can have a good first week for yeah. sure. You know, I thought that, you know, if, if nothing else, we'll set a few copies in our first week. But the, 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 the thing I love about the book industry, probably even more than TV, I think is, it is word of mouth. 
and nothing else. You're going to have a great first week. You will then fall off a cliff if people are reading it and, and not passing it on. And if everyone's reading it and passing it on to one person, you, you're going to do great. If everyone's reading it and passing it on to five people, then you're going to have a big hit, you know? And that's the thing I sort of noticed about books and, you know, countries that I've not even been to or visited where, where, where it's been successful. You just think, I've so, it's so lovely to see that just the story and the characters are dragging people in and you don't, you don't need the kind of sales and the hype and, 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 and this, that, the other, which is what I worried about in the UK. And so for me, the whole journey has been people loving these characters as much as I do. And that's a, that's a, a surprise and a thrill. So when you first wrote this book, it was sort of just a passion project and something to get your creative, um, you know, cuckles going and get get excited about doing something creative. But then now suddenly you've got these this hit book on your hand, this hit series. So then that puts a different kind of pressure on you as a writer to like, you know, they they talk about the sophomore, you know, yeah. uh, the pressure. I think I read that you had already started your second book by the time the first one came out. So there wasn't as much pressure for you on the second yeah. when the third book, which is this one, um, the bullet, the mist, uh, you, it was, do you, do you, do you get a little more nervous? Isn't it, suddenly this is like, not just about like your fun project side project. This is like yeah. a, a way of life and people are expecting stuff and you have fans and yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I think it's a really interesting question and I, I, I can see why people get paralyzed. I tell you that, I tell you the real problem is if you have a huge hit first book, if you look at like Paula Hawkins or something like that, or, you know, the Eleanor Oliphant book, yeah. people have this huge hit first book. And I, I had that, but I, mine was a series. So I, I had my characters already for book two. I know where yeah. I knew who I was going with. I had these people I knew people liked, right? And wanted to right. see more of. Whereas if you're Paula Hawkins, you've got, you sort of have to start again. Start from, from scratch, yeah. And of course she does, because she's brilliant. But she didn't, I, I had the huge advantage of, I knew my characters um, already. Uh, and I also slightly have the advantage of have a lifetime in TV has taught me about the capriciousness of ratings and the popularity and all that kind of stuff. And you can be up today and down tomorrow. And the one thing you've just got to do is keep your head down and do good work. You know, that's all you have, right? That's all you've got in the locker is to just keep doing the thing. Trust in the process, believe in yourself, keep doing the work. So I love the sales and the pressure and all that kind of stuff i love when i write, i love it for my cat when i'm writing the characters i'm sort of i sort of want to say to joyce you know people are people really like your diary you know people are really enjoying what you're doing joyce um, <laughs> so I, I didn't experience it as pressure in, in in a way i think some people might have done in some ways because i you know i love i love the process of writing and i learned so much in the first book of what to put in and what to leave out that actually in the second book and the third book I, I, I found that I found the route through simpler because if I started writing a scene and thought, oh no, hold on, this will, yeah, you're just going to edit this out. You know, you are. Yeah. I just didn't write it. Didn't I would write. just write the next scene, you know, just, just keeping the bits that people want to read. Um, obviously, every time it comes out, every time the book comes out, I feel sick because I don't know if they're good. Of course I don't. You know, I, listen, I love them, I'm proud of them. But, you know, when you write a new one, you kind of think, what if this is, what if this, this is one, one is bad? <laughs> yeah. What if this is yeah. the one that not only do they hate, but they also go, oh, hold on, this makes me hate the other two as well now. That I, and I loved them before. Um, so when it first comes out and you start, reviews are never of any interest to anybody. And I've, I've been lucky with reviews anyway, but it's, it's when you start seeing like people, like the Amazon ratings and stuff like that, when you, you, you can sort of work out that people are liking it. You know, you can kind of see in culture that people are enjoying it. Uh, and that's a huge relief. And then you just, you, you pass on the panic to the next book. You know, so I'm doing book four now and I'm just thinking, oh, this is the one. This is the one where <laughs> they're going to This is the dog, yeah. No, but, the you know, third, I'm, I'm telling I'm, you, the third one's going to be a, be a big hit. I, It's great. Uh, so I wouldn't... Oh, thank you. Um, but, uh, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll keep riding the horse until it throws me. Yeah, yeah. Well... So tell me a little bit, I, I'm just, am curious about your process because do you have like a ritual? Do you, you know, you're somebody who's, who has had a lot of success and I wonder if you're in an, it seems you're very disciplined in that way. Do you have like a writing ritual? Is there a way that you kind of get these books done in a timely yeah, manner? The yeah. The interesting thing about books is, is you, you said it right at the beginning, they're really hard. Yeah. They're, you know, it's like, it's like a marathon. It's, it's just really difficult. Right. And there's no, you have to work really, really, really hard. And quite apart from 
whatever magic might happen, nothing is happening at all without it being hard work. And um, it's just you. You're you're there's no, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's no team. I mean, later that. there's the team, you know, yeah. with the editor and yeah. but in the beginning it's but just I, you yeah, and I, I, I've had a career of collaborators and all sorts. And, and yeah. it's, so the, the only thing you can do is understand that you just have to do. So I, I tend to only write for two hours a day. But mm -hmm. I think anything more than that, it's, I'm, I'm not getting anything. Yeah. But when I write for two hours, I'm really writing. I'm not researching or looking stuff up. Right. I'm typing. You know, it's, it's the stuff that ends up on the page is going down in, 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 in those two hours. Uh, and if you do two hours a day or, you know, if anyone at home is sort of starting to write if you can do one hour whatever you can do just do it regularly because if you do it every day for you know i can write thousand fifteen hundred words in those two hours usually something like that so if you do that for 90 days you've got yourself you know a hundred thousand words and listen they're not going to be the best hundred thousand words anyone's ever had but they're there mm -hmm. and you know there's a there's a book there and then you go back and then you start so I never revise as I go along because yeah. otherwise you just never get anywhere. So I know that there's also sometimes there'll just literally be a scene saying, I am a placeholder. You know, mm -hmm. I sort of know in my heart, I've just written this scene. I just think that this is not a single word of this is staying in this. I know, <laughs> I know what I need to do in this scene, but I haven't written the scene that does that. This, I hate this scene, uh, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to write the best scene in the whole book. And I'm going to put it here, you know? Yeah. Uh, so you get to the end and then you go, okay, let's fill in those gaps. And then it's the process of winnowing and polishing and all what that. What about sort of in stuff. during those two hours of, like you said, you don't research because that's one of the traps that I fall into. And I know the other two is that I'm writing something. Yeah. Like, Ooh, I need to get on to the, you know, I need to research whether that's true or not. Do you write yourself a little note in those two hours saying like research this later, like in rewrite, like, so you don't stop your momentum and go online and Google? Yeah, or I would never, ever, ever stop the writing yeah. to look at something really. There's no, yeah, I just, I just, I just never would. And I think researching is not writing. I think it's yeah. absolutely part of writing, and but go and do it in your own time. You know, right. not, not, not in those two hours of concentrated time. Uh, but it's different for different people because some people can write for six hours, and in six hours, of course, you're spending a lot of that time on Wikipedia, right? Okay, I get it. Uh, but by and large, factual stuff, someone you know, they'll pick up on that and a copy edit. That no one's going to leave you hanging out to dry. Um, I I don't do a huge amount of research. I I, I sort of think well, yeah, but what do I reckon would happen here? You yeah. know? Um, and, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that if something crops up, yeah, leave it till afterwards. But if, if you can, this is different for everyone though, but for me, I have to just be on it. And I have, it, when, when I see that word count, I look at the word count all the time. When I see it's ticked over a thousand or it's 1200 and that day, I'm like, listen, I've got a bit of time. So I might write some more, but I don't have to, I can, if the two hours is done or the, thousand words is done i know i know i can just stop but i try and write a chapter a day that's my that's why i have short chapters i try and again very goal oriented yeah i try and beginning middle and end i know where i want the chapter to end i know where i want it to start let's get that chapter done and tomorrow i'll start the next chapter and that i, I find that's really really helpful do you do the trick of television where the end of every chapter is kind of teasing so you have to read the next chapter, like a sort of a cliffhanger at the end of every chapter kind of oh, thing. Oh, God, yeah. But, I, but not con really not consciously. Yeah. It's just you sort know? of. I, it's just given that my job that day is to write a chapter yeah. that starts in place A and has to end in place B with a story slightly changed. Uh, how else am I going to end a chapter? I'm not going to end a chapter on something boring. You know, you've always yeah. got to end a chapter on something, whether it's a little gag or a little you know, note to someone's personality or a cliffhanger. Uh, you, you've got to end on something and yeah the the lovely side effect of me liking to write a chapter a day is when you read it it's got short chapters and I always think a short chaptered book is a great book yeah that's a great you know? well, let's talk about your favorite yeah. books um to, in closing here because I know you're such a you know you've read you said you've read mystery crime novels your whole life so I'm curious which who your influences were I mean I've read I think Agatha Christie for sure um, oh yeah, for certain. I th you know, I think I think I think it would, it would be almost impossible uh, not to be influenced by um, Agatha Christie. But you know, at the same time, I love. There's lots of brilliant British comic writers who were like, you know, like P.G. Woodhouse and Evelyn mm -hmm. War and people like that. You know, I like that sense of the absurd. There's an amazing English writer I love called Michael Frayne, who writes kind of quite comic novels, but set in the real world, and I I, I love him. Um, Kate Atkinson. Uh, mm -hmm. If you've ever read oh, Life yeah. in Ruins, uh, Life After Life and God in Ruins, I think she's incredible. An yeah, absolute genius. 
Um, but you know, I, I, I love reading older stuff, but I just, I like reading what's out this week, if you know I me. Mean, that's what I love seeing what's next and you know, who's, who's writing what about what. I find that, I find that fascinating. I think I heard you read that you thought one of the greatest books you've read is, the, is Golden Hill by Francis Spufford. Spufford. Oh, I love that book. And again, <laughs> because, you know, honestly, I feel my job is, is, is as an entertainer, right? I want to entertain you. I want you to pick up the book and love it and just go, you know what? I absolutely love that. What a really great read. There are certain people who are incredible pro stylists, right? People where you just read and like there'll be a sentence that takes your breath away. Okay. Mm. That I love as well. Very, very, very few people can do both. Right, can write this sentence where you just go, Whoa, where did you pluck that from and how did you polish it to that sheen? But also give you a propulsive plot. Yeah. Right. And I saw On Golden Hill by Francis Buffett, which is about the very, very early days of uh, New York City uh, and about someone turning up with a promissory note uh, asking to be paid a million dollars. And essentially, that we have a mystery and we have this incredible writing. And anyone who combine those two things, I can only do one of them, right? Yeah. I'll do the enter- I'll do the propulsive stuff and the entertaining stuff, right? Some people can only do the other bit, and almost no one can do both. Uh, but that that book is a perfect example of someone who can do both. William Boyd, I think, is is is, is pretty good at doing both, and actually, Kate yeah. Atkinson is pretty good. Very good, good at doing both. the literary, but also popular fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Richard, this has been so interesting. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to talk to you and I'm so excited about the, the future. I, I, you know, I'm bummed that I've now read the bullet to miss because now I got to wait for the next one. Sorry. Um, it'll be a while. <laughs> but I, hopefully it'll it's come. Next year. Have you started it already? The fourth? Yeah. Yeah. I started okay. it. I'm, 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 I'm such a writer. I'm already behind. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah. have a wonderful, um, a wonderful rest of your day. I'm just starting the day that you you're ending here in Los yeah. Angeles. So <laughs> I hope it was it's a been good a, such a pleasure, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you, Richard.